Hello everyone. Welcome to Violin Basics 101. My name is Helen Kim. I'm the violin professor at Kennesaw State University. Today I'm going to guide you through some technical elements of violin playing. When I meet with students, the two questions that I most often get are how can I improve my intonation and how can I improve my tone production? Today we're going to break down, down those elements. So the intonation will deal with the left hand and the sound production will deal with the right hand. Before we get started, I want to make sure that you guys get your violins and hopefully you're working over a carpet or soft surface because I will be doing some bow work with you. This is the Esther Piazzolla Tango Etude number no. 3. basic stance and um, the bow positioning. So for this, I would like, if you are following along, to make sure you have a carpet in front of you and a place to put your violin down. Um, so to begin with, I want us to put our violins down. So violin playing is actually very physical. Not many people think about this part of playing, but um, 
as I've been playing for many years, I notice different uh, um, things that affect my students and myself in terms of pain and uh, finding the most natural way to play the violin. So number one is when you're practicing, I want you to always stand. Um, I know you may be tired, but when you stand, you're going to feel better. And number one is I want you to stand very straight and let's find the top of our heads. Now right now, I want you to find the center of your head and kind of find your hair where it is and pull, pull on a little bit. Imagine there's a line straight up to the ceiling, straight up to the ceiling. So we're going to stand really top. Again, what you want to make sure is that your neck is on top of your spine. So this is key. You want to make sure your spine is straight and your neck is on top of your spine. So we've established that. Now observe your shoulders. And what you want to make sure when you're playing the violin is that we don't get any upwards movement or tension. We want to make sure that it's basically at normal talking level. Um, easier said than done because it is a very awkward instrument. So the next thing I'd like you to do is let's just take our violins now. And whether or not you've played for a month or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, this is something that is going to be a work in progress to find the best fit. Again, we're measuring the distance between your collarbone and your chin to fit in this one slot here. And we need to find the perfect solution in terms of what is the right height, because basically you want to have the seam fit right under there. So then when you turn to play the violin, you just have to kind of gently rest your chin on the chin rest and that you're not building any tension in your shoulder. So again, with our perfect posture, we're going to bring the violin to you. You're never going to meet it. So we're going to bring the violin to you. And gently place and just rest your chin there. Um, another really good question I get often is, does the left hand help with the um, holding of the instrument? Indeed, I am of a school that believes that it's a combination. So of course you should be able to hold, but also um, flexibility of the neck is the most important thing. You want to keep movement whenever you're playing. So you should be able to lift once in a while and adjust and when you're doing that, your left hand will catch, catch a little bit of the weight there. So that's the most important thing. Again, this, your, your teacher at school or your private teacher is going to help you find. Um, many people use different uh, shoulder rests. You probably noticed I started with a sponge, then I moved on to like an inflatable life raft. And I finally found this um, shoulder rest that kind of seemed to fit my body. But even though with that, I still had to make adjustments. As you can see, it's not pretty, but it feels comfortable. Now with my college students um, that I work with, where again, your bodies will be changing until you're grown up. And even then a little bit, then you'll make adjustments as your neck grows. One really handy thing that I'd like to, to experiment with, and then you can just get like a terry cloth towel or just a handkerchief. And usually for my students, I find that the area that's the hardest to fill is this side of the violin. Usually this side we can kind of get, it's a little bit more narrow, we can figure that out. But right in here, everyone's just a little bit different. And this is the part that if it's not fully supported, you're going to be taking the weight and tension into your left hand. We don't want that at all. So you can, you can experiment at home with a cloth or a towel. And what I would suggest doing is just kind of placing it under this end and seeing what feels good. And, um, especially at the beginner and intermediate levels, you want to make sure that you can find a kind of a, a really good angle that's flat and comfortable for your left hand. So then the alignment of your left hand will always be smooth and comfortable. If this is moving constantly, there's no way we can shape those basics. So that's, that's the uh, left hand. Now let's grab our bows. This part is interesting because, um, Again, when we're talking about the human body, let's look at our arms again. Our arm wants to just rest at our side. So my whole life, I'm fighting to have a straight bow. A straight bow is essential for a beautiful sound and unfortunately, still not the most natural feeling when you're doing it. Um, so let me help you with this because there's three distinct angles that you can look at when you're making a down bow and an up bow. And so let's go into plank position, bring the violin to you. Now let's go into the middle, put the sounding point or where the bow meets the string. Let's go on the A string right in the middle. And I'm going to move back here and you can see that my arm forms a square. So at the middle of the A string on a down bow or an up bow, you're going to be a square. Now the trick is middle to tip. This is where everything kind of can go wrong. And what I'd like you to do is go ahead and travel to the go on the down bow. And what I want you to do is keep your arm by your side, try to make sure it doesn't go away from your side. So you want to keep it right by your side 
and extend your wrist. So now you can see I've made a triangle with the tip of my bow, shoulder, and the frog. Now we can see the wrist that's extended almost to a right angle. And you can also see that I can't use my entire bow. Everyone's gonna have a different amount of bow. I have students that have lengthy arms, can use the entire stick, and some that have shorter than me that is about here. I'm kind of in the middle. Once in a while, I will cheat. If I need a lot more bow, and I'll go a tiny bit crooked, but that's for very special occasions. So again, at the frog, it also is a triangle. You can kind of see the elbow, hand, shoulder. So this is triangle, then you go to the middle, then you're at a square, sorry, that's a square. We go to the tip, and that's another triangle. So these um, angles, again, if you find the common denomination, it's the wrist. And we're gonna spend a little bit time more on the wrist. I would like to now focus on the bow. The bow, of course, is the focal point of tone production. I like to think of the down and the up bow differently. The French have a really good word for down bow. In French, it translates to pull, and the up bow translates to push. So this is really a wonderful thing, because I want, whenever you're playing the violin, you want to think about your arm as weight. So when you're playing... That the down bow is weight of the arm and the up bow is your um the up you're drawing the sound of the violin and you're never pressing the sound those are really important things to remember let's take a look at our bow hold a lot of people refer to it as a bow grip that's key i want you to think about it as your bow hold so now in this case i want you to put your violin down i want you to hold your violin bow in your left hand like so so you have it in front of you, and I want you to shake out your right hand. So shake it up, put it up directly in front of you, have your hand nice and limp like a spaghetti noodle, and I want you to just kind of drape it down, let the fingers drape over, form a circle between your thumb and middle finger, and then have them all draped over. So this is gonna look more like a cello bowl hold if you've seen your friends in orchestra playing the cello. But I just want you to bring up your wrist straight. So then your index finger will be folded slightly there, and the, the still you have the circle there, and the, the fingers will lie gently so the pinky will be placed. So now we have a very relaxed bow hold, not a bow grip. These elements of making sure that our fingers are nice and relaxed of the bow is probably the most important thing to change your sound with. The first technical uh, term I want you to be familiar with is a term called cole. It's a French word for meaning, uh, the meaning is glued. Now let's get our violins out and we're going to try Cole. I would like you to place the bow on the G string at the frog. And now what I'd like you to do now is just rotate over to the E string, right? Without making a sound, just kind of rock it over like a seesaw. Now what you see here is that my wrist is not moving. It's the fingers are, are going to flatten. So now I want you to go from the G string to the E string. G string to the E string. You can notice that my fingers are straightening and curling. Now we're gonna shorten the distance, G to the A, and G to the D. And let's do this just for a little bit longer so you can get familiar with this rocking kind of motion. It shouldn't feel like an effort. It should feel like um, that you're playing with a yo-yo almost. You're throwing your fingers, you're curling them back up. Now we're on the G string. What I'd like you to do, still holding your wrist lightly, move your bow in like about a centimeter or an inch. With the flat fingers, curl them back up. Flat. Curl. So this tiny motion of the fingers, I think is the most essential element of developing a really good bow arm. You'll find that when you're trying to phrase and make beautiful tones last longer and continuous without, without that click of the bow change, this is the thing that's gonna facilitate a, a very beautiful and even sound. Um, let's try now at the middle of the bow with the same stroke. So again, using just your fingers. You can see my forearm's not moving or my shoulder. 
It's the tiny muscles right there that you want you to get really comfortable with. Let's go back to the frog. Let's travel to the tit. I'm going to move back. So to recap, when we talked about having a straight bow before, this typical, um, the Kolei motion is going to facilitate having a really good bow. Um, this leads us to the next topic. We could explore a lot more time on the Kolei, but that's something that I think you now have a full grasp of. And just if you can incorporate two minutes a day of this, you'll feel a dramatic result from that. The next topic is martele, which from the Italian word for hammered. So it's a kind of a strong stroke. My students know that I love this particular stroke. I will demonstrate first and talk about it. So I'm just gonna take a G major scale. Well, actually, maybe I'll do A major. beautiful sound but what I'm trying to show you is that you want to put all your arm weight on and when you start a martelly stroke there's that sound that initial contact is like a click stroke so you will place on the bow release and just let you will release the pressure in a very fast bow speed and now you'll be at the tip and the same thing where you're gonna make an assessment of your bow weight. Am I really relaxed? You want to have that full arm length and this is a wonderful warm-up because it's going to build your tone. This will give you an idea of how much weight of your natural arm weight that you can use on the string. What I want you to imagine with Martele and with the bow for this and back to finding your grip is imagine when you're younger and you're hanging on the monkey bars and you're just kind of hanging there I want you to imagine that your arm is the same type of thing. You're just draping the natural weight of your arm on the stick like that. So then when you get into playing position, everything from your arm is going to pull the sand out back to the French word for gambo. You're going to get a really resonant and full tone. So this is a tone building exercise. So you can incorporate this into your scales. So to recap the cole, I would do little strokes of the frog. And I go through the scale once, then I'll do the martelly. With a very full bow. And again, the most important thing to think about with martelly is at the beginning of the stroke, kind of assessing, is this my full arm weight? And the down bow should be pretty comfortable. You should feel okay. That's the entire weight. Now the up bow is a little more tricky. At this point, you want to make sure that you're thinking of your index finger here and make sure your wrist is straight and the flat, the, the hair is quite flat and parallel to the bridge to get a balanced, even sound. Next up, we're kind of covering a lot of ground right now, but I want to get through some of the basic things. The role of the fingers on the bow. This is an interesting thing to me because when I was younger, I just assumed that it was equal, that we held on for dear life and what came out was what was going to happen. And I was lucky enough to have really wonderful teachers and I met a wonderful violin teacher named Joseph Gingold, who was one of the greatest violin teachers that taught out of Indiana University and I got to play for him in a class. He had this wonderful exercise and he talked about the role of each finger on the bow. So let me guide, guide you through that really briefly. So his idea is that the frog it, the bow kind of just wants to be there. You don't really have to do anything. So let's just take a note. Let's take open D and you start the frog. And here he said, lift the pinky and play. Go about a quarter of the way up and lift the third finger. Get to the, about the middle, lift the second finger. And then finally you just have the index finger. And we can come back up. There's an index, second, third, and pinky. So this is something I'd like you to try at home again over carpet in case you feel worried that you'll drop your bow. But again, we'll try it again. So we'll start at the frog, lift the pinky, lift the third, lift the second, lift the first. So what I'm gathering from this information is that at the tip, 
the most important part or boss of the bow is going to be your index finger for giving weight. The next finger is the assistant to bringing it back up. And the fourth finger kind of resumes our normal plane position of the wrist because, again, we've hit this angle at the tip. You, we want to come back to this angle here. So to guide this transition, the fourth and fing uh, the pinky will help bring us back to that. So they are very important rules roles in playing the violin. Um, the pinky is probably the most important because it really does hold the balance of the stick here. So you want to get really comfortable with knowing that each individual finger has its own important job on this train. Another really fun thing I like to do when I'm, when I'm in a meeting or not playing the violin here, let me get a pencil, hang on, is you can just do little exercises with a pencil at school or when you're just relaxing a little bit. You can do the Coley motion just with the pencil where you have it in front of you and you practice your bow grip, your bow hold, excuse me. And you can really kind of get a sense of the flexibility of your fingers. Because again, this is kind of key, again, to essential smooth bow changes and having control over many different areas. Topic number three, spiccato. This is probably the question I get the most when I meet with students. How can I have a spiccato? I need one quickly. Tip number one, so when you go for a spiccato, remember that the bow naturally wants to bounce. If you look at the bow, it's curved. In the middle is usually the sweet spot, somewhere around there. Because if you start, if you, let's say, just drop your bow, it's going to bounce. So I often tell students, so what I'd like you to do is remove your pinky. If you want, remove the other finger. And just drop the bow there. You're going to notice there's a natural bounce there. A lot of the times when we're trying to produce an off the string stroke, we get in the way by operating our bigger muscles like the shoulder or the elbow or the wrist. You want to think from the stick back towards you because it wants to bounce. So often I'll spend, what I'd like you to do if you're having trouble with a stroke is just drop the bow and think about something else. Let the bow do its bounce. Now eventually what I'd like you to do after you've gotten a feeling for that is to drop the bow on one on one and just let it hit the string. So again, there's a, a bouncing point right there that just kind of wants like it's like a ball, it springs into action. I want you to start doing it, letting it drop, gradually speeding it up. do with a metronome where you just on a scale the action of the fingers is that um, they are so loose the grip you can examine your bow grip, bow hold at this time. I had to correct myself. I, I want to change the wording to a bow hold. But your fingers should always feel like when you're playing spiccato that someone could just take the bow away from you. Do experiment with that because I find that's the thing that usually will immediately change someone's ability to do spiccato. It's usually you're gripping a little too hard. This in turn leads to muscles that are a little too tight. So remember with spiccato experiment, this is my... Um, method of doing it. Every teacher is going to have their valid method, but for me what helps me is to think from logically from the bow where it wants to bounce as a natural bounce. And you can control this because if your fingers are just um, just gently holding the bow, you kind of follow that natural bounce and just kind of ch just change the bow again with the little muscles and not using your shoulder or your elbow. So I hope that helps, but usually I found with my students that the first thing is to think of finding the natural bounce and go from there. The next question I often get is about ricochet, which is exactly the same, where you drop the bow, but we control the landing. So it's the same type of thing where I would suggest doing a scale with 
four and one, three and one, two and one. But again, remembering that the bow wants to bounce and that you do not need to hold it tight. That's the key thing. If you do not hold it too tightly, you'll be fine. Let's see. One other thing I want to talk to you about is just making sure that, again, when you are uh, bored and you're wondering what to do that can improve your um, bow hold without practicing, I'm doing it right now, is you can do this little game where you just kind of let the bow slide through your fingers like that, because that's exactly the type of grip you want to have. You want something just absolutely light and effortless. Um, and remember, again, that with your bow hold, the thumb and the third finger will be the balance point in terms of the, holding the balance between the two and the outer pinky and the index finger are very important um, in terms of the, the kind of, it's like a fire truck where, well, that's not a good analogy, but they're both equally important. Um, basically two drivers on opposite ends of the vehicle. Lastly about bow, um, regarding the bow technique today, is the use of hair. Often students ask me, well, what, what should I be doing? Should I be doing flat hair, side hair? It honestly depends on the piece. Um, for me, when I'm trying to build um, tone control and sound, I always opt to practice with flat hair for solo playing. So when you're doing your skills, I want you to, again, take a look at the hair. Make sure all is placed very flat and try to maintain that all the way through. <coughs> It's a really good rule of thumb to just really check visually to make sure that all the hair is indeed placed. It's so easy to kind of lose track and that'll also help with a straight bow. The next last, okay I lied, the last topic of regarding the bow again is the point of contact that we touched on briefly and it's where the violin resonates on your violin the most as you'll find your favorite point of contact. Usually it's in about the middle. But for certain music, and you might have noticed in the piazzolla, I do experiment with going to different uh, lanes. Sometimes I tell my students that I feel like there's about four or five lanes. It's like I-75 right here. Um, and depending on the character of the music, you can really change it. For instance, in the piazzolla, if I just wanted to play it a little bit, like a little bit edgy. So it has that kind of biting sound. Maybe that's a little bit too much, so I'll go away one lane. like that a little bit more. Now if I want to contrast, you can go all the way towards the fingerboard. And that will change the character. So a lot of fun things we can do. Um, we don't have as much time as I want to today to work on everything in detail, but I just want to cover those elements. This is a bit of the preludio from the Partita number no. 3 of Bach to demonstrate string crossings and the use of the fingers to change the string height, string crossings. have a really pivotal role in string crossings. So I hope you'll do that cole exercise because it greatly facilitates pieces that have all this kind of exciting string crossing business. The first thing I want to talk to you about uh, intonation is shifting. Shifting is getting from one position to the next position back to the originating position. One of my favorite things to talk about is the use of something called the guide finger. I'm sure most of you have heard from your teachers about when you're doing a shift, meaning going from one note, from one position to a note in a higher position, of how to get there. And the guide finger is 
basically an intermediate finger that shortens the distance and measures where you're going. It's like a little marker on the map. So I really love the use of this because, for instance, a, a big shift to me, what rather than hoping for the best, all I need to practice is So now, instead of a big leap like that, I'm just having to worry about this. That is so much easier, infinitely easier. So in the beginning of the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, for instance, we start in second position. So I always know where my first finger is underneath. And then you start on that note. Back to the one. Now I'm going to fourth position. Four, then I'm going to the six. So the other thing we need to talk about is extensions. So, which means what it sounds like is if you're playing here, you could extend your pinky to the next note. So you'll see this line right there in a stretch. It's basically a stretch, but it means that your finger uh, the other fingers stay in the playing position. So they stay in home base, one stretches out and comes back in. A very useful tool because the, the key to intonation again is getting really comfortable with the thumb and knowing where, where you can extend from. So even when you're shifting, you should be really aware of where your thumb is. Which leads me to my next topic finger tension. So we talked about the right hand of also being absolutely loose and just barely having um, a hold on the bow there. It's the same thing with violin left hand. The, the, the less you squeeze, the better you're going to have control over the element. So back to our shifting, one of my favorite method books to use, I'm going to grab it right here, is the Sevchik Shifting. Opus 8. It's wonderful. It teaches us to shift between all the positions. So the first um, idea would be you play a, a, a pattern in first position, something like this. So that's exactly what we just talked about, shifting from first to third. The next thing they would do is practice it from second position, starting on the B. Going to fourth position. And the next one, so fourth, third to fifth. And so fourth, fourth to sixth, fifth to seventh. And the wonderful part about this book, if you're just beginning, you can just do the first one and leave out the other positions until you're comfortable. But you're going to find that just this getting to know your instrument this way. Again, with no tension, with not squeezing the thumb, is a really fast way to get to know your instrument. These are all things that I'd like you to incorporate to your daily schedule. So Sefshik is one of my most favorite um, etude books. I also have this double stops that we'll talk about after that. Another quick trick is, especially if you're beginner to intermediate violinist, is let's find your natural harmonics. By that, I mean you might have found them already, but on fourth position, so if your root note is B, there's an E there, and that the E will ring, go parallel. And a lot of beginner and intermediate violins already know where these harmonics are, because I'll ask them often in technique class. Can you find those? Now, if you found those and you already have fourth position, it's a great landmark to have because the, the instrument will ring true in tune, and it's a great thing for you to be able to have that reference point, because first is no problem. Usually third is pretty good, and now you have fourth. So we're well on our way to mapping out our violin. So shifting, if you can do a little bit of basics of shifting every day, that's wonderful. Next topic, double stops. So I just talked about the Sefshik double stops. It doesn't really matter what method you do. What I like about the Sefshik book is that it has fourths and sixths and octaves, all the building blocks that are necessary to strengthen our, our left hand. So this is opus nine. The preparatory studies for um, double stops. These are public domain. They're on IMSLP, so I believe I'm allowed to talk about them here to you guys. So I want to start with fourths because this is one interval that we don't often do. So it's a perfect fourth, meaning that 
We'll start on the root note of an A. Counting up, one, two, three, four, that's a D. But we're going to play with our open D, so. clean tune but the idea about those forces that will ring really in tune it will help you find your pitch for a single note really well so for instance if you're playing an A on the G string you're wondering I wonder if that's really in tune I want you to tune that with your open D now the violin the open D will suddenly ring very loud and you'll know that note is in tune and the next thing we're going to do is thirds because it's the same way where we tune to the whatever open string we're playing. So we'll take the B on the G string and the open D. right there I could spend probably 10 minutes just trying to make sure that everyone is in tune there. What's wonderful about this it builds strength in your left hand but also it can uh, kill two birds with one stone because you're listening all the time because if it's really in tune the instrument will sound the overtones of the instrument will carry over and it'll sound really loud and beautiful. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention as I was doing that is if you ever have a one three um, like you must hold those down and then place your four and two after that. So those are the fundamentals of playing double stops. I'm just going the briefest overview of that interval, but it's something if you, again, incorporate at any level, even if you just do one double stop per day, you're getting a better understanding of your instrument. Um, I like to add in octaves to that. So let's go ahead and try that with your open G and your G on the D string. that we've done so far I've always done the bottom the lower voice the top voice then together that's something I like to do first and then I go through and play them as a block chord it's a great way to um, get strength in your hand again and to again really use your listening when you're practicing these double stops to see are they ringing in tune and this way you're going to develop a really keen sense of where things are resonating I'll talk a little bit about vibrato now vibrato is something that I work on after the intonation of a passage has been achieved that I'm sure it's very much in tune because again, we don't want to um, hide the pitch, we want to enhance the pitch. I always view vibrato as the spice, like when your ingredients are great and you just need a little something to make it special or the flavors to pop. Um, it's really important that uh, when you're starting with vibrato that you're working with a private teacher or your orchestra teacher and that you're really listening to all the instructions because it's really a step-by-step and not something that we can learn on one day. However, there is a few things for you uh, beginner and intermediate students that are just starting out. If you want to start to explore vibrato this summer, there's some little handy tips that I can give you. First off, what I really like you guys to do is make sure that your posture again that we talked about is absolutely in check. Because again, this arm position is key to vibrato and the, the way you're holding your violin. If you're not really comfortable, then there is going to be extra tension on the left hand, you can't fully um, explore what your vibrato possibilities are. So again, remembering our posture, straight bringing the violin to you. And then very gently, what I'd like you to do is practice just sliding. Let's take the fingers relaxed, very limp like a noodle. And let's go on the A string and find your harmonic that we talked about. And so we're in, basically in that position. What I'd like you to do is just take your whole hand and just gently slide up and down so there's no pressure the fingers are just gliding across so you're just kind of getting this rocking motion in the wrist right there so 
So this is a very basic thing. And now you can take each finger. So I'm, this is not gonna sound pretty. I'm gonna take the third finger. And just using a harmonic. Now do the second finger. Now the first. And lastly the fourth. Now we're gonna make that uh, slide even bigger. So I want you to use your whole arm. And you can see I'm starting to involve the wrist. So everything is working together. So you wanna explore with this gentle rocking motion where there is flexibility in the elbow and the wrist and they're all kind of working together. And lastly, that the fingertips are very lightly pressed because you don't want any tension. You want them to be able to, again, respond to the vibrations. So those are some little tiny things. Next, I want you to try tapping. So let's take the F sharp on the A string and very lightly tap with the fingertip. And you can see that my finger, my hand starts rocking. So this is another good vibrato motion. So you're just building this familiar, you can do all the fingers. I always like to start with the third finger. The third finger is really a central, it's a comfortable hand position. So if you're just starting a vibrato, this is a great exercise just to do, not for too long every day, but just you can tap it on every string there and just start to get that feeling of flexibility. So again, the mo most important thing is to make sure that this alignment is correct and that your posture is good before you get into vibrato. Um, so when you've done that, then you could start doing just again with a metronome very slowly. Let's just take um, the F sharp on the A string. So third finger, third position. I like to, I like to put the metronome on 60 and very slowly start on the note and walk back. Then Um, that with every single finger um, and I do that as a review even with my scales just to make sure that I'm feeling nice and relaxed again the key thing is flexibility of the fingers good alignment and um, working with your private teacher this is something that is not a crash course but I just want to touch on it but the main my, my philosophy of vibrato is that it's again just to enhance the sound after the intonation has been perfectly achieved
Lastly, today I wanted to talk about organizing your practice schedule. Depending on how much time you have, and I'm hoping that if you're thinking of really jumpstarting your violin playing this summer, that you can devote a significant time of practice to violin playing. About half of it should be on basics if you're an intermediate beginner player, and about a quarter of it should still be on basics if you find yourself intermediate to advanced. Your teacher will advise you, but doing scales every day is the most important thing. Scales are the building blocks. Um, all the violin concertos and all the wonderful pieces that we play cannot be played without the knowledge of the, the scales. Next, we talked about shifting etudes and double stop etudes. Those are equally important. And with the right hand techniques, that's something that you have to do every day again, because that's again, not a natural um, place for the arm that wants to be. So again, we talked about the straight bow and the three triangles to make sure that you're keeping the bow straight, especially at the tip. So there should be a triangle with your wrist at the tip and also at the frog, because there's always going to be forming these angles. Again, the flex of the other wrist. We covered cole, which is very important because that is going to enable you to play all sorts of things. Once you enable this motion, your spiccato, your staccato, your ricochet, all those things are just going to start to feel really flexible. Um, and the martelle, again, that is really helpful in just finding your voice on the violin. It may sound extreme to be playing that loud, but again, you're again setting your posture and finding your balance points in your bow, which are key to improving your tone. And actually, I think that's probably the fastest way. If you do two minutes of martelle every day, you're going to find that you are able to find your posture and your sounding point. So these are some points that, um, that I like to incorporate every day into my practice schedule. We didn't have that much time to get it today, but I wanted to kind of go over areas that I feel that would be useful for any level, whether you've been playing six months or six years. Thank you so much for joining me and have a wonderful summer of practice.